Welcome to the One Within All, and thank you for attuning your divine attention to Interverse. This podcast promotes the infinite potential of all people by putting our perspectives on patterns and practices that expand our incredible imaginations. I'm pulling out all the stops here creatively in this intro so that you can start carefully hearing and be enlightened to, to new meanings by the care that our dear guest of the day has prepared in her spectacular speech and her whimsical ways. Long have I longed to share my love for our magical language by bringing you a conversation with this wonderfully stunning and oh so cunningly punny person before me. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the wordacious wizardess of novel neologisms, the notoriously gregarious global guru of good vibrations and pretty poetry, the one and only <laughs> Laurel Arca. So dust off your dictionaries and start stirring up your synonyms. It's going to be a punny show. While I always aspire to write interesting introductions, today I'm on fire with inspired elocution. Thanks to spending the last week diving heart deep into the various media that Laurel has appeared on in recent years. Affectionately known as the metaphysical mother goose, Laurel reveals occult meanings hidden before our eyes as unconsciously uttered linguistic white lies. And by exposing the programs inserted in the sentences that make up our lives, she has helped many magical beings break free of language slavery and put spirit back in its place in our hearts and our words. Like Laurel, I love to point out that heart and earth are anagrams, and whether it's for performance poetry or fantastic fiction, Laurel Arica is a beloved spirit in the hearts of many souls around the earth. So check the show notes for links to Word Magic Global, her website, and her album of recorded performances by the same name, and also for links to the extended version of this episode at patreon.com forward slash interverse where you can support your favorite show and get access to the whole archive of plus extensions. And while you're there, look up Laurel on Patreon as well, because she's got many new offerings there for those who wish to support what she's doing. And now it's time to look at the words we take for granted in a new light, aligning left brain and right to get to the heart of meaning that underlies all words when we realize that every sound we make and thought we think is magical. Welcome to Interverse Laurel. I think we're more than ready for our linguistic system updates from you. <laughs> well, they're flowing through you so loquaciously and so perspicaciously that <laughs> I think we can just continue with the conversation wherever you'd like to take it up. And, and I, I applaud you. Your work is magical and has a velvet velcro in its vibration thank you alliteration is one of my all-time favorite ways to use words uh, i remember learning about that in high school and i thought it was brilliant that alliteration itself had an sort of consonant ring to it where all the syllables sort of just had a rhythm and it turns out that our words are pretty much magical all around and the more that you stop and think about what other meanings you could divine out of a word, the more you start to see the programming that's actually in your own mind regarding how you unconsciously believe certain things. And that's how you create your language story and narrative. And as I've got a little cat walking around me right now, it brings to attention just one of these words that's so sort of deceptive, which is animal, a word we use all the time. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately that the two roots to this word, ani and mal, mean bad spirit when put together. Ani is spirit and mal is, is like a negative connotation. So I guess my first question for you is what should we do about deceptively negative words like that and wh what others might you have noticed? What you've discovered, that's a bit of anagrammatology which is the science of exploring what certain sounds and concepts are doing. They are mated to each other vibrationally, visually, metaphysically. How did these come together to project a, a picture in our mind that would program us to respond in particular ways whenever that you know particular stimulus came about? So there's so many of what I call the secret spells of the English language. And my most uh, viewed YouTube video is called the secret spells of the English language. And 
It talks about how the very way we describe our day condemns us to another hell again. That we awake in mourning and go off in a week days to earn our living, though urns are for the ashes of the dead. We call our jobs undertakings. Job itself is a Hebrew word for persecuted, Job. And what we get at the end of this perverse bargain with life is weakened, progressively more and more weakened. So have a good weekend. I mean, what does that mean? Why not at least have a good strong end? Have this be the time off in which you flower and flourish and grow exponentially because you are breaking through dimensional glassways that have confined the mind in the past to a story that is a mirror of reality. It's the way live is turned around and becomes evil. The thing to do is to navigate via the heart because we each have the built-in compass in the heart. It is the compass of compassion. So by being able to grow more clear in ourselves and more caring for others, which is a natural outgrowth like a flower in the sun, for self-love to flourish as love extending beyond the self to the whole self, to the allness and oneness that we collectively are an aggregate part of. So... There are words that send people off in the wrong direction. We have pray as in pleading to God and pray as in becoming a victim or creating a victim for what our own nourishment. And prophet, the great wise one, prophet and prophet, the bottom line of the whole economy. So when you have pray and profit, when you look at those two words, the reflections of the two of them, you see that, um, well, let me give you the other two, (laughs) worship or worship. And the old, old, uh, I guess, Phoenician or pre-Hebrew word for worship that is translated into the Old Testament, it actually meant work. So that's another like etymology beyond just looking at the way words make you feel or the more obvious under the surface meanings when you start looking at it from a middle perspective. There's also the whole etymology and ancient language research that one can do to start getting some very different stories out of mythology and scripture and even words that we hear as like maybe names of corporations or things that we actually thought were just made up words but really meant something. Like Pepsi is uh, Egyptian, an Egyptian god of chaos or something like that, a, a god of darkness. There's, there's lots of stuff like that. What I, I really like about what you said is the idea of going from a heart-centered perspective. Earth is an anagram for heart. I think it's, it's the fourth planet and it's uh, – well, if you count the sun, it's the fourth body, right? And whenever you look at the heart chakra in the Vedic system of chakras, it's the one that's in the middle. It's the fourth. And so being between our left and right brain, being between our masculine and feminine side, being in balance between all forms of dualism and polarity that we could have, that's how we can see the extra meaning underneath things. Because if we're just looking at it from only like the left brain perspective of the dictionary and contextual definition, we won't see beyond the surface. And I guess what else could you say to explain this idea of green language or heart language or What I I like when it's called the language of the birds in occultism. I have an article on that subject. I don't know if you saw it. It's, It's online, Awareness Magazine, Language of the Birds. So let me see where to begin. Well, my belief is, see, there's the word leaf and be a leaf. It's all us. These are our internal organs in the collective oneness of us all. And a way of speaking, a way of making music that is elemental, that that is literate and literary and elemental in the sense that it harmonizes with all of nature, 
we will regreen the meadows of our hearts with sacred psalms and incantations. And in any case, I have a whole vision of what happens when we tune up the language. And it is a collective endeavor. No one person can invent a new language and expect others to accept it. But each person holding the same high intention to speak a language that makes the plants grow, that supports, facilitates the metamorphosis of human consciousness, that we can do, each of us together, scintillating word by word, contributing to each other and beginning to put into circulation. Then we so tune the language that it's scintillating and the scintillation is uplifting and people are drawn upward into their higher nature. <laughs> and we create the momentum like a, a tsunami of positive consciousness. And maybe we need to play with that word tsunami. That might be very interesting to explore and maybe reverse. I don't know. But in any case, yes, we could do it. We could create a chorus of beautiful music through our social intercourse with a language that has been so tuned up that when we speak to each other, we're uplifting each other. That there is a scintillation. It's like it's like um, energetic acupuncture where we're moving, you know, in in harmony with each other. And the energy is so rich and so fine that we're both amplified. And in that amplified energy, higher frequencies are drawn to us because we're like a battery. <laughs> and then we we dance for as long as we're meant to together. And then it might be a minute, it might be a lifetime. And then go dancing with others, always with the intention of elevating frequency through every word we speak. I think that what we are able to do to actually create what you're talking about is just having fun with words and being honest and reflecting with each other. The concept that I've had for a really long time, that was sort of, I guess it came to me early on, way before I even started podcasting and led me to want to do podcasting, was when I realized that just like two notes that are being played on a guitar that can create a harmonic sound together, two souls, whenever having linguistic intercourse, as you call it, we are actually creating potential harmony or dissonance in that. And so whenever you're talking to somebody and you're just opening your heart about anything and you start feeling more and more excited, it's only natural that you also start to care about that other person more. But the third component that comes in when you have the care and the excitement and the fun is the imagination. That's what the imagination is what creates that extra new awareness or insight that you reached when talking to this other person yes. that you've never had before. So I call that soul harmonics because you actually learn things that you know that you didn't know that you knew until you were with the other person and they brought it out of you. So I think that's kind of the, the nature of what you're talking about. Yes, absolutely. And you call it soul harmonics. That's, That's what I beautiful. came up with a long time ago to describe that feeling. And actually, yeah, it led me to podcasting because I realized, oh, I could apply this concept and uh, sort of shotgun blast it out to a lot of other people as I'm doing it because it kept happening for me. So I thought I better share the love. Wonderful. Yes, that is exciting. And that's kind of the picture I have of like two people meeting and, and interacting as we are like batteries for each other, amplifying batteries, uh, meeting, mating, exchanging, amplifying, elevating. <laughs> exactly. Just like that. One word that I'd like to expose people to, one of the things I'm really appreciative of you for is introducing me to new words. And one, this might be kind of rehashing something that you've talked about on other podcasts, but I thought it was so great it is worth bringing up again. And that's the odyssey of life, the oddity of life, and the odyssey, the word. <laughs> Can you tell us what that means and what it means to you? Let me get centered for a moment. I feel like I'm contacting the spirit of the word <laughs> as if I was a, a seance medium between the human and the elemental dimension. 
I, I did portraits in poems of people. And I was doing one for a gentleman and I wanted to write about the odyssey that he had been on. So I was rolling that word over and over in my head, the odyssey, the odyssey, the odyssey. And finally it rolled into the odyssey. And I thought, the odyssey, that has to be a word. So I looked it up in the dictionary, and indeed it is a word. And it's a vindication of the goodness of God in relation to the existence of evil. That is just a fantastic word. Uh, and it, it's so perfect because isn't that what the hero's journey is really all about? Coming to our personal balance and learning to appreciate everything that seemed unfair about our life that made us who we are now and makes us appreciate what we actually have come through. That's beautifully and brilliantly said. And also just looking at mythological stories that involve the hero's journey, there's something that's just unbelievable in itself. The, the Odyssey and the Iliad, all those Homeric poems would have been recited by memory by the bards of old. And that's one thing that I've been impressed with you about is how you sometimes will just drop into rattling off some of your writing that you've got memorized. And I was wondering, do you have any tricks for that in particular? Or is it just something that is, comes natural or do you practice? I think of rhyme as an electropoetic force. So when I'm playing with rhyme, it's like I'm playing with magnets and balancing energies and putting them in relationship to each other in ways that just delight me. And so once one comes together with another, <laughs> once there's that coupling of, of a big, beautiful idea with a wonderful sound that has several meanings, then I want to hear it in my head over and over and over again, because it, it moves through my heart and out my ears. It's like, it's like this lovely self-stimulating experience. So that's how I memorize my work. Little magnetic union after another, and the rolling experience expression and experience of feeling the words, the sense and the meaning so eloquently joined that it's easily memorable for me and easily imbibed and enjoyed for others. That would be a really cool thing to do in general would just be a, a little mini performance of of any of your work, just to give people a taste of, well, of some thank of that. You. Where to begin? <laughs> I think I'll begin with one that nobody's heard, and it's called Word Fire. And when I was in my 30s and I was on a date with a fellow, and he said, what is it that you want to do with your writing? And I answered him immediately, bypassing my thinking, and said, I want to set the fire on page. So this is a piece called Word Fire, and it really is a true story. I received my education from the fine electric dots of silence. The carbonated fizz and fuzz of all that is or ever was because the slender flower of consciousness that pushes through the concrete mind has broken through the hardened places where my heart had been confined, allowing me to feel and hear what God reveals as we draw near. Now I've grown joyous and devout by living from the inside out. And here's one insight I was told. If your heart is heavy, it must be gold. So first I wrote with the quills that I pulled from my heart. For the blood of our wounds forms our ink when we start. 
Then I pulled off the cobwebs of ancient ideas and began spinning yarns as my own panacea and to weave empty space like the finest of lace with the echoes of word twins I placed face to face. That was page one, and we'll see if page two wants to emerge in a moment or two. Yeah, it's actually quite remarkable that you chose that one because it's sort of what was on my mind for the last 20 minutes as we've been speaking is the notion of living from the inside out. Something that I've been really reflecting on today and almost in an imaginary way, finding a conception of what that would feel like and be like that then began to come true, strangely enough. And it's almost like seeing yourself from the outside yet living completely from the inside. As you said, if your heart is heavy, it must be gold. Well, that blood that you spill onto the page that is your authentic self made up of all the wounds you might have ever had or all the trials and tribulations that you thought were so impossible, that is the authenticity and that's also the gold because gold is AU on the periodic table, which is what authenticity begins with. It begins with the gold. So that's uh, sort of what you got me thinking about. And it's all around us. This uh, the spirit and this closeness to the divine source is possible in any moment. You can just look into the trees and treat it like a 3D magic eye puzzle. Let your eyes sort of defocalize and step into that liminal stillness between left and right and between passively observing and imaginatively interjecting. And I think that's the flow space that you like to inhabit. And I, I see you channeling and it's very still and silent yet resounding and almost violent, a cacophony of verbal beauty that <laughs> has got me on some sort of poetic bend right now. So thank you for it just really igniting all of this creativity and passion in, in me and hopefully the, the audience. And this is exactly as fun as I expected. <laughs> Although, of course, what could I have expected from such an infinite personality as yourself? I guess I'll get around to asking you another question. Um, just what do you think the imagination is or what is spirit? Uh, how? <laughs> let's go all the way. Well, the imagination says what it <laughs> is. It's I'm a genie. That's perfect. And when you turn it around, you om it's almost perfectly letter for letter, but just not quite. Imagine an enigma. They're essentially uh, echoes and reflections of each other. And it takes imagination to solve an enigma. So I believe imagination is our ability to stretch out our tendrils <laughs> and to, to receive higher frequency energies and, and continually make room for them by letting go of the disharmonies. Yes, letting go of the disharmonies is the way to improve your imagination. It's often been said enlightenment is a destructive process. And what that really means is getting out of our own way stopping doing things that are hurting us more than starting to do anything special because we're already special and it's the it's the crap and the armoring that <laughs> actually makes us feel unspecial and feel stuck and feel heavy we're actually omnificent that's a word that i learned from you as well would you like to define that one for us well yes it's quite gorgeous but i want to back up for a moment about five minutes ago the reflection you were giving me on my work and encouraging people to be go out in nature and see multidimensionally would have been a perfect moment to share a piece of your artwork or two. I hope you will consider doing so as part of our conversation together. Yeah, it's not something I talk about on the show all that much that I'm also an artist, but I will include in the show notes, and I can splice it into the video version of the show, some of the artwork that, I was, that Laurel so graciously asked to see before we started talking, and I did show off. I like to just get into intense marker doodle flow states that sometimes, sometimes it's 15-minute bursts that last for two or three months until the thing is complete. 
but yeah, that's something that that's my <laughs> that's my personal favorite creative outlet besides just having these soul harmonic conversations. And thank you for recognizing and uplifting that in me because it gets pushed to the side a little bit with other responsibilities that I grant myself. And I find that in life, we often do create tasks for ourselves that will take up just enough time that we don't quite have the resources to do our special thing. So how have you experienced that particular dynamic in your life? And um, what would you call your perfect day, I guess, if you could describe one? You know, you're asking me a question I haven't really asked myself to any great degree. So perfect day is when I awake in such a state of harmony. I feel so much peace running through me that comes up from the earth through me and connects heavens and down. And, and like all of us human beings, we're plant things and, and we're all living in harmony and, and I'm living at peace and quite personally, I like the idea of living in the forest, maybe in a tree house or in a little mobile tiny house where I can be such a part of nature as I write and just enjoy my life that I'm able to translate this language of the birds and the bees and the leaves and in English. <laughs> and I'm speaking metaphorically, I believe how that would look for me human and physically, I really haven't pictured and probably ought to do so. Well, there's no real shoulds other than certain things maybe you shouldn't do to other people that you wouldn't want done to yourself. Other than that, it's we're, we're pure freedom is what we are. So I think your answer is quite perfect. And although it's a useful trick for me to sometimes reanalyze my daily habits and behaviors and think, where could I trim certain things out and add certain things in to be a more ideal per version of myself. But yes, if, you're, if your starting point is total peace and stillness, then your creative energy and imagination are going to flow freely through every moment that you're living. And it really doesn't matter what you're doing. You're going to make ideal choices for yourself because you are truly being yourself. So I thought that was a great answer. It's not it's not the typical answer I get when I would ask someone that question, but it's an enlightened one, I would say. I would love your response. But let's back back, back up and talk about uh -huh. our omnificence. What, what, what is that word? It's just such a beautiful one. I have never met anyone who knew the word omnificent. I came across it in a dictionary. It felt like as if it was by divine appointment. We all have grown up hearing omniscient, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, present everywhere. That could describe and has described God. It also could describe Big Brother. So it's not a very empowering image. <laughs> People know those three, omniscient, omnipotent, um, and omnipresent, never met anyone who knew omnificent, which means possessing full creative power. And we are all omnificent, <laughs> though hardly anyone has heard the word before. We all possess full creative power. And people sometimes say, well, I'm not creative. But as a species, we've already demonstrated that we possess full destructive power. So the other side has to be true as well. And the 1% in consciousness can continually do as we do to elevate our frequency, letting go of everything that does not serve so that we can be more available to an ever greater infusion of divine love intelligence to be able to use in our own creative, unique ways that are so entertaining, like a butterfly that spins its own wings and every most sensuous elemental experience you could possibly imagine that you can have just by raising your frequency and living in harmony. So all of us together in my 
picture of the future are tuning up the language so that as we speak, I can one piece it says, uh, for if our words so melt the heart, they start the milk of human kindness flowing. So that every time we speak our mind, we set another flower growing. Then I believe before our very eyes, we human beings, like butterflies, will fully metamorphosize. And it goes on from there. So that's the kind of enchanted green language I picture. Uh, the butterfly metaphor for humanity is one of my very favorites because although we seem to be in a hyper-destructive phase like you just described, it's also a pattern that you can observe in the caterpillar that it sort of just grows and eats leaves willy-nilly without a lot of seeming care about what's happening to the leaves that is consuming to the point sometimes or they might kill plants that are that they're on a group of caterpillars or harm them but then that caterpillar body becomes the butterfly through a process of what are called imaginal cells activating inside the caterpillar and these cells transform spontaneously into butterfly cells while it's in the cocoon phase the caterpillar's body actually begins to fight against these cells as they change because it is being consumed by these imaginal cells as they connect and network and transform the body of the previously destructive creature into something that's in perfect balance and harmony with its environment and goes around helping the plants and doing lots of good. So I think that that's definitely our potential as beings right now and changing our language is a key component to that. I'm curious if you see an architecture of control or authoritarian hierarchy in the world and in the word, the world of words, <laughs> worrying in world, that's uh, W-H-I-R-L-D, uh, or I may not have spelled that right, but you, you catch my drift. Uh, yes. Do you, see, do you see that there or do you see it as an outgrowth of our own loss of personal responsibility or is it some sort of kind of two-way collusion? Well, let me take a moment because I want to back up. You said something. Your explanation of something just a few moments ago was so beautiful and so right on. And that if you uh, illustrated it, wrote it down, illustrated it, and then created a book for a metaphysical children's book for children and their parents. It would be a great gift. And so when you <laughs> find that and write it down. Uh, it's definitely a thread worth pulling on, the, the notion of humans as butterflies, right? And if children grow up with that mindset of how can I – change the world that I find into a more balanced and harmonious one instead of what is really seemingly enforced on kids, the idea that the life happens to you, the world happens to you instead of us happening to the world. I think that would be key. But thank you for the compliment. I, that'd be fun to write a kid's book and to illustrate it. Uh, yes. It's, <laughs> it, it would definitely be fun. Make a coloring book out of it or, or who knows. Uh, but but back to the, the question a second ago, do you see any kind of architecture of control in the world? I could answer you in verse or, or straight on. However you feel. So I'll do a little stanza that responds to the question, and then we can play with it further. At first, I suspected the hand of collusion, entangling the language to foster illusion. And I think it's quite true that a word's etymology has a great deal to do with a culture's theology. But now I don't think it's planned for the thing that I've found is that like concepts can gravitate toward the same sound and vibrate at the rate that our thoughts designate. Because words are electromagnetic vibrations whose fine alphabetic tintinabulations can take on the tint of our true expectations. 
which they then imprint on our metal of mind, causing sounds to adhere when they're of the same kind. So by this I mean, certainly there had to have been some intentional propaganda implanted. But perhaps on an even larger scale, I don't know really, it's a natural function of language to, for sounds to congregate. And language, as we speak, we're sounding our own depths. And the consciousness that is being hypnotized out of people or hypnotized them into through all the media and all the, all the craziness, that's reversible. We can become creators of the language we speak by tweaking it, by tuning it up. And tell me if I'm still on your question or have left it unanswered. Oh, no, this is definitely where I was going with it, because I think that you're right that, as Confucius would say, the degradation of language is a symptom of a society's corruption or, I guess, lack of coherent unity and care. Uh, coherent care is really what would bring us bring us together linguistically and cause us to flourish it with, with brighter and better words, whereas today we do see a loss of the the flair and the pizzazz and the vocabulary of generations past maybe partly to do with people reading less and watching more things like that but i i the question maybe that i'm more interested in is do you suspect non-human interference with the human story that's a, because we're speaking about multiple dimensions of language ha having potentials beyond but in my, my estimation of the world is that all is self. So even something alien wouldn't be fully alien when looked at through this perspective. But what, what do you think? I basically do my best not to go there. <laughs> because whatever the reality it is, my intention is to live at my highest reality. And I have no other alternative so whether we're alien slave clones or any of it, I don't know. I certainly would love to help us all speak our way back into elemental harmony. And then I don't believe anything of a lower vibration can exist at that frequency. That's my fantasy. Well, that's exactly why I even would want to ask you this question. It's not something I necessarily bring up uh, that frequently in podcasts, although maybe my friends will know that I love to jump into any and all crazy conspiracy research that I can find just because it fascinates me to see all the connections and serendipities and synchro mysticism throughout history. But what you say is the absolute bottom line truth, which is that what we think we are is what we are so we certainly don't want to think that we are some sort of alien slave clones despite the potential for that to be the case why don't we just agree that our potentials are infinite and therefore that's why we'll never maybe even pin down our ultimate origins because our origins are from an infinite source that cannot be defined <laughs> that's kind of the point of the source is that it's indefinable ineffable it is the the all and also the therefore like the nothing and the stillness. So that's kind of why I wanted to ask you that question because I knew you'd have an enlightened answer on it that, that, that sweeps away the fear, which is false evidence against reality that causes us to believe that we have a loss of personal power in any situation. Okay, that's why I wanted to bring it up so that we all know that we actually have full power and it has a lot to do with the story we're telling ourselves. Yes, that is the word omnificent, possessing full creative power. It's very close to magnificent, which is a, a beautiful world. It's like of majesty. And I believe we all can live at a frequency of majesty, of, of divinely human royalty. And it's a, a quality of consciousness that 
puts one at that elevation. And the healing of the instrument to hold an ever higher, finer, sweeter vibration. So you'd say our bodies are like an instrument we're playing in a, a jam session. Yes. I don't know if I would call it a jam session, but that's, I know that's the popular word. Uh, so we're closing out on the first hour, the free hour. It would be a great time to point people towards some of the ways that they can find you online before we take our little break and go into the, the good stuff. <laughs> hour two. I have three different performance pieces, and there's one specifically that gives my vision in in sort of a short kind of clear yet rhythmic and perhaps amusing way. If people are familiar with the viral video I have, it went viral when it was posted on the Facebook page of Collective Evolution. That's actually where I first saw you, so I'll be sure to post that. It's nice and concise, and I really enjoyed it. While the Secret Spells of the English Language presents a a quick window into the problem that I discovered, uh, my anthem, Taking Command of the English Language, outlines what we can do about it. And if you would not mind posting that one, and I can send it to you again, it's been my second most popular video, but it hasn't had the same level of exposure. And I think people should, if you're going to pick just one or the other, people listening to this episode ought to choose taking command of the English language, because although the other one is fun, we actually covered quite a few of those concepts in this uh, in this okay, conversation. Perfect. So I, I would watch both if I was you guys. But that, <laughs> if you had to pick one, do do check out taking command of the English language. Well, that would be so lovely. Thank you. And so what I want to share in verse right now is the overview, just a fairly quick summary, which is that English is the leading software of the Western mind, and it's filled with cultural biases that are akin to computer viruses that infect our thinking with an antiquated and manipulated vision of reality originally promulgated by the church as an instrument of mind control to perpetrate this antiquated vision of reality at a time when people had to surrender their minds if they wanted to keep their heads about them quite literally. So if we elect collectively to upgrade the English language to a higher frequency through our linguistic creativity and naturally occurring verbal eccentricities, then ultimately even clatter from our idle chatter, prattle, patter, blabber, blather, and palaver as we jabber, gab, and Babylon, will turn our glowing terms from verbal vapor, either hanging in the air or trapped on paper, into tiny bits of shiny matter as we gather, chat, and natter on, and with new skill at trilling, thrilling statements that instill fulfilling imagery of higher possibilities will finally still the quiet riot of the wild child's manic panic through the mind so we can flip the switch, enlightening every circuit of our consciousness with the electric surge of verbiage that encourages superb and selfless services to spread from soul to soul around the globe by what is said in all the light years up ahead. And then... From the islands of silence between all that's spoken, we will listen as doors to the heartland spring open. So that's essentially my vision in verse, which is outlined more fully in taking command of the English language. And what I'm inviting people to do is to open with the intention of listening to the still small voice and downloading new symbols, sounds, words, metaphors, and phrases that can convey a higher frequency of consciousness in our communications and inspire a greater frequency of kindness in our interactions with each other. So. 
just ask, and, and in taking command of the English language, I use the example of random acts of kindness and senseless beauty and how that altered behavior around the planet for a period of time. And that it occurred to a single individual, it was a download someone received that then uplifted conscious behavior around the planet. And that each one of us can be the catalyst for these kinds of catalytic words, terms, and phrases that can elevate human interaction and consciousness simultaneously. So... I have a forum, a new forum button on my website, Word Magic Global, and people are invited to share their word there. And I will help put in circulation along with you some marvelous alternatives to some of the ambiguous terms we have that may uh, make sense consciously and yet undermine Consciousness, consciousness subliminally. And one of the examples of uh, a beautiful word someone suggested after I shared what I call the secret spells of the English language and our life sentence, and I asked, what shall we do about the word hello since the syllables reversed become oh hell? And a woman suggested we use hallo instead And hallow is to make holy, to respect, and to honor. So if we were to say hallow to each other rather than hello, it's equivalent to saying namaste. Someone else who experienced my work came up with the word gratefulness as gratefulness which is what the experience is. This was a woman named Gail Lynn, and I use that all the time with a a heart of gratefulness because gratitude does create a a full sense. And we use the term appreciation for money and without for when it grows. And we also expand with appreciation and gratefulness. And a fellow named Jeremy Rumble came up with the term for forgetfulness as forgetfulness. And I talk about the the crippling disease that most of us suffer from of uh, of temporary loss of infinitely long-term memory. I call that I amnesia. And Jeremy Rumble calls it forgetfulness. So there are all these messages in words. And as we make them more conscious and share them with each other and come up with new words and metaphors and phrases, we really can help facilitate our essential evolution from humankind to human kindness. So my intention when I have enough people working with me, a a tribe of people, is for there to be an invitation for Word Magic's literary lotto, where people can send in the words and phrases and symbols and sounds that they download with a dollar for a committee to review. And those that we feel will have the highest potential for a positive catalytic impact on people, these are the ones we will market in a variety of different ways, T-shirts, bumper stickers, whatever it is to help permeate the culture with higher consciousness. And the person who came up with the idea will be honored as the prophet and profited with our marketing efforts. So the idea of upgrading language, which was uh, an epiphany I had, and I define an epiphany as a sudden recognition of the obvious, After I had that epiphany, I learned that Confucius said, when asked what he would do first if given charge of the governance of a country, replied that the first thing he would do would be to correct language. And he explained that if language is incorrect, then what is said is not what is meant. And if what is said is not what is meant, what needs to get done remains undone. And if this remains undone, arts and morals deteriorate, justice goes astray, and people stand around in helpless confusion. 
and Orwell himself, who has said that politics corrupts language and language once corrupted has corrupting real world influence, also said that we can begin to make changes at the verbal end. So that's something that all of us can do. We can feel extremely powerless with the insanity that's dominating world policy today, the absolute egomaniacal battles of the broken children in office. And yet we were raised with the awareness that in the beginning there was the word, that there is something highly potent and creative in the word. And English is the language that's rebuilding Babel's Tower or has already actually done so. So this is our opportunity and our time to test our articles of faith in the positive power of the word by putting it to good use with high intention. And that's what I seek to motivate with word magic and facilitate on my website. And I'm available for conversation and for sharing. And the intent really is to create a global movement for linguistic improvement that honors the power of the word recognized in every culture. It's not just the Genesis myth that said in the beginning there was the word. So that's that's my vision for Word Magic's literary lotto, where you open up and ask for the divine genius within to start speaking through you and informing you and helping to upgrade the language. Wow, that is definitely a divinely inspired idea. I love how you've made a game out of the notion of upgrading language, some, make it participatory with people who might be fans of what you do and probably very interested to interact and join this lotto. One thing that it, I was thinking about is that with, at least in my life experience with like my friend group, we will tend to come up with our own versions of words for things, special <laughs> words, secret codes and things like that. And it's also so easy for weird and sometimes just kind of asinine slang words to go from being a small little cliques phrase to all of a sudden virally spreading across the planet. I could think of several like, and the way they morph is very strange, such as, uh, there's one that the, the youngsters used to say, they'd say something is on point if it was cool or good or, or whatever. And then all of a sudden, all around the country, everyone started saying that's on fleek instead of on point. And like, how the hell does that even happen? I don't know. But I think it's a good idea that we start uh, investing more intention <laughs> into this meme magic that is possible to uh, ignite things for good or ill in people's mass consciousness almost overnight. So I think that's a great idea you've got. And I, I'm going to participate. I hope others do too. Well, thank you so much. And it's so fun um, when you either see words within words. I mean, that's part of it too. Like I, I shared with you yesterday, the, the magical word, beautiful. It's like it, it spreads out its wings and you see that it really means be you too full since there's nothing more beautiful than the fullness of the expression of an authentic being. So the words are constantly informing us. I've certainly found a few, but my God, there's we have at least a million words in this language and so many different ways of looking at them and so many new words that we can bring through. And the article that I wrote called The Language of the Birds, do a search for Language of the Birds and Laurel, Erica and Awareness Magazine, you'll find it. And it, it also lays out this vision of a green language where our, our speaking is so in harmony with nature that um, our rapport creates an open sesame such that um, as we speak, flowers grow and we uh, 
you know, the whole notion of Eden, I looked at the word Eden and I saw, oh, it's an anagram for need. And I, so I thought, well, the fact that all needs were met may even be the reason need and Eden share the same three letters of the alphabet. So if we're speaking a language that is in harmony with nature, then all the bounty of nature can't help but follow us wherever we go. We've been speaking a language of hunger and deprivation, a fear-based language. And I'm, I'm writing, as I shared with you, a series of essays, one of which it, called Defining Moments, words that invoke a whole world in a few syllables, if you know what I mean. And one of them is about changing our terms of agreement. And for instance, how can we possibly have a, a calm nervous system? That's an oxymoron. <laughs> we need to we need to give it a different name. And how could we not be nervous when we're living in the atmost fear? And the media keeps us at, at a peak of atmost fear of one form of annihilation or another. So it's like all of this language can be morphed to support our evolution instead of our decline and decay. And it's up to us all to do that. And, and so what I offer is a, a forum for sharing your thoughts and your gifts. And as I said, when there's enough people participating with me, then we can have a committee to assess them and we can have ways to celebrate the prophet who received them. I mean, I could go on and on about this, so I don't want to abuse your listening or your listeners by doing so, but there's just so many beautiful ways that we can honor ourselves and each other by opening up to higher consciousness. And as we exercise the muscle of listening to the still small voice inside, it will grow. So the muscle grows stronger, the downloads get more powerful, and then we become the creative geniuses that all of us were meant to be. You're speaking my message. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. I did not mention that I do writing and editing for uh, people with projects whose intention is to uplift consciousness on the planet. And they can find what I do by going to myname.com. I'm sure being that this show is aimed towards the creative and the artistic individual, we're bound to have some writers in the audience that maybe someday would like to connect with you. How would uh, your services be standing out from other editors? Well, recognizing a written document as a piece of verbal music and tuning it in such a way that the sounds and scents are in an exquisite harmony that makes the communication very receivable by your audience. And of course, the more you tune up your frequency, the more that will appear in your writing. So I am a, a nitpicking editor because I believe every letter and word has a power and a role to place in the communication of your ideas. And it's essential for there to be music in that communication in a mental exchange kind of way. So if you're understanding my communication here, I'm a very precise writer looking to create the clearest copy, the most receivable way of communicating the idea and eloquence of language. So that's what I can do. I can also do less levels of editing as well. My website is L-A-U-R-E-L-A-I-R-I-C-A dot -E -I -I com. Well, we've had a perfect conversation as far as I'm concerned. And the last thing I'll ask you for the, the free show is what is Kotodama? Is that how you say that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's how I've heard it said. Yes. So Kotodama... I found I found it online. It was about it was quoting it was a Bill Moyers interview with an author who was quoting a Japanese novelist who talked about Kotodama and it's the recognition that words have elemental energies, that there's word spirits. And so it's about being very 
conscious and honoring of the place that you give a word to live in a sentence. That's my understanding of Kotodama. And my understanding of consciousness is that energy is consciousness. And like you've stated, and anyone that sort of thinks about it can realize words are electromagnetic vibratory energy patterns that we cast into the world. And so elemental spirits that may or may not live in something are going to be structured around the intention and consciousness energy that's projecting into whatever that creation is. And that's my understanding of elementals anyway, fragmented consciousness forms, not fragmented as in fully separate from the creator, although perhaps elementals that take on a more demonic bent might be of a fragmented nature. Whenever we create from the heart, we're extending out of ourselves into a physical manifestation, whether it's words on a page or paint on a canvas, and that infuses, literally infuses our spirit, the one great spirit, spirit itself, into the object, and there you have it. That's the elemental aspect of our creative power. At least I, I speak as if I, I know for certain, of course, this is just my perspective, <laughs> but it, to me, it makes sense. The other thing I wanted to mention is the Patreon site and the fact that I have so much material that I would like to bring out into the world with very well crafted videos and motion graphics so that I can show the extent to which I've discovered that the alphabet is computer code that programs are thinking. And I believe on one interview or another, I shared my piece on the letter S called Esoterica by Laurel Erica. And I have a piece on the letter I and various other little letters. So, it's so much fun to play with words. People of all cultures and all ages have done so, and it's an enlightening form of entertainment, and I hope everyone will feel inspired to participate with me. Yeah, I would like to hope that there's an artist out there that might want to help animate something with you or collaborate in some way, add music to something you're speaking. I know you're out there, people, so <laughs> please uh, get in touch with Laurel. You can find the show the links and for uh, her, all of her things, many videos and and uh, some of the articles she mentioned and her websites on the episode notes. So check it out. Thank you, Chance. I just have such high regard and great love for you. You are such a beautiful, divine, kindred spirit. And I'm very grateful to you for the opportunity to have a, a, a most delightful and exciting conversation. Yes, the first of hopefully several, I would think, because I can think of many areas that we didn't go. And there's plenty more that we can talk about as we both continue to learn and grow. Yes, absolutely. Well, my love and admiration and great appreciation to you. Thank you so much. Holy vowel. We did it. Another episode. Really, really grateful to Laurel for coming on the show, taking a chance on me, having no previous experience talking to me. We still had quite a good vibe together. Very easy to connect with someone like her. Couldn't have asked for a more fascinating conversation about word magic, which I think is a really important topic because as we get more conscious of what the words that we say mean on both an overt and a subtle level, I think we'll have an easier time saying what we mean and doing what needs to be done, just like the Confucius quote says. So yeah, thank you, Laurel, for coming on the show. Really fun time. I hope that maybe any artists or animators or musicians out there who might want to collab with her on some future word project, please get in touch with her. Remember, her website was laurelarica.com or wordmagicglobal.com. The forum that's on there is quite a cool idea. She talked about the literary lotto, and I have actually made a membership on her forum, and I posted a new word or a new phrase on there. Whenever I racked my brain for what would be a good thing to revise about how English works, I thought, well, morning, there's one that we kind of brought up. Morning being a state of despair, or like maybe not despair, but you know, sadness over the loss of a loved one. 
why not make mourning something else? It kind of seems like the opposite of what mourning really is to call it mourning, since mourning is something you do at the end of a life. And that time of day is actually the beginning of life for that day. So maybe we should call it call it the morning. <laughs> I know it's kind of goofy sounding, but maybe you could just say good morning to you. And people might not even notice that you said something different. And if they did, then they could be like, why did you say that? And you can explain to them, because I want to invoke birth and renewal and life and not sadness and death. <laughs> I don't know. That's what I put on her forum, though, as my entry into the literary lotto. Not that exciting of an entry. I hope to think of something more clever and post it on there. Would love to see what you guys come up with. So join her forum. That, was, that would be fun. There's links to everything you might want to find regarding Laurel here in the show notes. Just go to interversepodcast.com and find the page or look it up on whatever podcast player that you are using. All the links will be there, including links to the episode music by Suhan. And speaking of music and getting help from creative people, I wouldn't be opposed to having one of you wonderful listeners who makes music help me come up with some kind of bumper music for the intro of the show. Something I could use every time at the beginning. I would still find other music to feature in the outro, maybe between segments, but I think for magical purposes, it would be pretty cool to have the same intro segment, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, 60 maybe, of music that we could infuse and imbue with all of our interverse intentions, which I would assume are to uplift imagination and creativity in the world and in ourselves. And great thing about having consistent intro music is it gets in people's head. That's magic right there. It makes people think of whatever it is that you're doing. And if it's not like an advertising jingle getting stuck in your head, it's something you actually like, then I think that'd be a good thing. So maybe somebody out there will help me with the little magic project of crafting a perfect musical sigil introduction little thingy deal. So help me out <laughs> if you want. If not, that's cool. I'll keep doing what I'm doing. Eventually, I'll get some kind of intro music that's customized for the podcast, even if I have to make it myself. And maybe that would be a better answer. I would have more time to look at stuff like that if I could get more time for the podcast in general by freeing myself up from other types of work I have to do to support myself and my family. And one way that you guys could help make that happen, help make Interverse a better podcast and help me get free would be to subscribe to Plus. Interverse Plus is available at patreon.com forward slash Interverse. Also there at the show notes. And if you need a reminder, what we do on Plus is double your pleasure, double your fun with an entire second hour of the conversation that we have on the free show. And so with Laurel, some of the things we talked about were more speculation on how English evolved into its current form, synchronicity stories and cloud paintings, and how everything in the world sings and dances, Laurel's work on the Book of E and Alphabet Alchemy, and how you can get a free copy on her website. We talked about getting in sync with higher vibrations instead of syncing into lower frequencies, S-I-N-K. And Laurel gave a lot of really good book recommendations, awesome things that she's been reading lately. We talked about the philosophy of finding truth by seeking beauty. That's a big one. Aesthetic philosophy. I think that's the foundation. And that was a really interesting topic to get into. And then we talked about opening up your third ear and evolving from humankind to human kindness and how to ask higher powers and parts of ourselves for creative inspiration. And that was far from all of the things we talked about in the Plus Extension. It was a really good one. One of my favorite episodes in a long time, like I was saying, just because of how whimsical and wacky yet informative and interesting the conversation was for me anyway. So that's kind of a taste of what you can get on Plus. Aside from this episode, there's a whole bunch, like 30, 40 episodes out already that have full Plus Extensions for you to dive into if you happen to subscribe. So Y'all ought to do that if you want to help me help support your favorite show and get more out of this podcast. I think it would be pretty awesome. And I guess that's all I had to say to you guys. I think that we had a fun time here today, don't you? And I look forward to the rest of October. I've got 
a great many fantastic names on the list coming up throughout the year. Only two months left and three months left in the year. Wow, my math is bad. <laughs> We're getting there, though. Love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. I hope that you may have found some inspiration for the way that you speak, write, or at the very least think by listening to this episode. And please help Laurel and myself with the restructuring, reforming, reimagining of the English language. It's something that benefits all of us to do some system updates on that particular operating system of life. And I think that we can. I think that we can definitely evolve from humankind to human kindness, as Laurel said. So keep your third ear open. Keep looking up. And most of all, keep doing your thing. Love you guys. Talk to you later.